Hello everybody and welcome to another Tonebase live stream. Today I am incredibly excited to be introducing to you my good friend, amazing musician and just all around really smart and expressive guy, Manuel Sovich. I am really, really excited about this one because unlike some of our live streams, this is going to be a public live stream. We are going to be talking about applying basic emotional theory to musical performance and we are loving Live at the same time on Tone Based Live, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, possibly, if the Instagram software I'm using is working right now, which I can't tell. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much to everybody who is here with us. Let me just explain a couple of things before we move on. If you would like to ask a question, you can only ask questions currently on Tone Based Live. You can, of course, comment on the video on Facebook, on YouTube, on all of these other platforms, but if you'd like your question to be featured, in the video itself, then you have to comment on Tone Base Live. This is a free event, so I absolutely encourage you to go over to Tone Base Live right now. Click the link on Facebook, it uh, should be in the description. Uh, join us there, I'm really, really excited. What happens if you do ask a question on Tone Base Live? Well, in that case, I can put it on screen like this. Hello, Jonathan. Jonathan says hi from New York. Hi to you too, Jonathan. Uh, so, uh, if you, <laughs> Jonathan, the reason why you're only seeing your response is because you've used the ask button, which is perfect. That is how I wanted to ask your questions. And unfortunately, on the system, we have ask the ask section and the rest of the chat are separate. So if you just click on the chat, uh, you will be able to see everybody's questions as well. So if you are on Tone Beast Live, the way to ask a question is you will go and click that red ask button that you see in the bottom of the chat. And that will allow me to overlay this video, this question in the video. Uh, the chat on Tone Beast Live is not saved with the video, unlike Facebook or YouTube. So as soon as the video is uh, no longer live, the chat is gone, but the questions asked using the uh, red ask button will be there. This might seem a little bit more complicated than it really is. What this really means is if you have a question, just join us on Tone Based Live. It is a free event right now and you'll be able to ask this question. Obviously, only if the video is still live. If you're watching this uh, after the fact is a recording, you won't be able to ask any questions because we won't be there anymore. Uh, in any case, I would like to begin by saying hello to everybody who is already here. Ron says hi from Farnham, UK. You see how I pronounce that? I knew I know how to pronounce UK names. Um, actually, so, uh, Ma Manny, Manny, Emmanuel and I were colleagues in the UK. We studied together at Royal Academy of Music, but we'll be talking about that in a second when I introduce him. Uh, Valentina says, hi from Edmonton, Canada. Mehmet Yusuf says, hello from Sydney. Thank you so much for waking up at 6 a.m. to watch our live stream. Igor from the Basque Country says, good evening. Uh, this is Igor from the Basque Country, not Igor, the co-founder of Tonebase. Uh, we love all Igors equally in this uh, live stream. Stephen Holland says, good morning from Iowa City. Iowa. Derek says hi from Kendall. Kim says hello from Denmark. Gunnar says hello from Stavanger. Marek, hello from Poland. Celeste, hi from Boston. Luis, hola chicos desde Galicia, España. Bogdan says hello from Siberia. Miroslava Shladlako Shadlakova, sorry for the mispronunciation, says again hello from Slovakia. Bill Young, greetings from the sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Zhuang from Portugal says hello, Victoria. Hi from the UK. Palmer, hi from New Jersey. And Paul from Lincolnshire, UK. Kevin West from Oregon. A lot of new people here. If you are new to Tone Based Live, let me begin by telling you that we have live streams an average of four to five times a week with all kinds of inspiring artists and musicians. We've had live streams with people such as Scott Tennant and Bill Cannon guys, Rafael Aguirre, Marco Tamayo, Sharon Isbin, uh, Gabriel Bianco. Uh, if you've heard of them, they probably were on Tone Based Live. So uh, follow the link in the description of this event to go to Tone Based Live and watch our collection. A lot of these are actually free for you to watch. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. So uh, I do encourage you all to go there and do this. In addition to everything, we also have forums in which you guys can ask your own questions. You can talk about the live stream that uh, is going to happen soon. Uh, you can ask questions and continue to talk about the live stream after it's no longer live. The link to the forums is flashing on screen right now. Uh, if you are on Tone Based Live, then you can also find a link to those forums in the description below. So I'm going to be repeating these throughout the stream just because we have a lot of people watching us externally that are not on um, the other uh, that are that are not on the other um, uh, on, on Tonebase Live normally. Uh, thank you so much, by the way, to everybody who is joining us on Facebook and YouTube and uh, and uh, Instagram. Uh, I see that there's quite a lot of you. Uh, all right. So in addition to this, if you have any questions or suggestions for uh, things that we should host on Tonebase Live in the future, artists that we should bring on or topics that we should feature, then feel free to send me an email at mircha at tonebase.co. I do take these. 
uh, if you have a tone based subscription, uh, feel free to mention that in the email so that I know that you are coming from there, not from Facebook or YouTube. Uh, thank you so much, everybody who's already here. Vilio says ciao from Vancouver. All right, without further ado, before we do anything else, let me take a second to introduce my wonderful friend and great colleague, Emmanuel Sovich, from um, uh, all the way from England, right? From Bright Brighton. Is that where you are? Hello, Manny. Hi, Mircea. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be with you and uh, all your viewers today. So, um, yeah, well, we, with Mircea, we, we go way back, as you mentioned. We, uh, we studied together at the Royal Academy of Music. That's where we met. So it's very exciting for me to have my first public event after about a year uh, with you. I, I couldn't really ask for a better company. So thanks for having me. It's my great pleasure to have you on here. Uh, by the way, to everybody that's watching us on Tone Based Life, if you could let me know, sometimes when I stream to four different locations, what happens is that um, the, um, uh, the guest video gets a little out of sync. So let me know if Emmanuel is in sync or not. Uh, I don't know why that happens, but sometimes it can happen. So, uh, all right, it's great, uh, it's great to have you on here. So uh, what is it exactly that we're going to be talking about today? I'm really fascinated. We don't have to drop into it right, right away, but I wanna know a little bit more about the topic that, that we'll be discussing. Uh, what is it? <laughs> sure. So uh, it sounds uh, quite obscure, like what on earth is basic emotion theory. Um, but I came across it, I think, in, at the Royal Academy of Music in the library. And uh, as most things, you know, good things happen, usually it's with a very tight deadline, something like a, a paper to write for two days time or something. And I was just scrambling, looking around for interesting topics to, uh, to base it on. And I came across this, which just seemed really interesting. So. Um, what is uh, basic emotion theory? Basically, it's, it's something that emerged in psychology in the 1970s, and it, um, it's a kind of a model or a framework that says that human emotions um, are composed of, uh, or basically we have a small number of basic emotions. Some people say it's nine emotions, some people say it's seven, uh, which I find slightly unimportant. Uh, you know, the, the differences, but the fact is that there's a small amount and any complex emotion that we have can be explained as a combination of these. And in psychology, they studied this by correlating emotions with facial expression. So this was a big deal like a couple of decades ago. And then that was carried over to musicology. And that's where I find it really interesting because it just has helped me uh, develop a practical framework around which to um, base my, my interpretative, my performative decisions. So that's what I, I hope to share today with, with the viewers, something perhaps unusual uh, that, that some, most people might not have come across with otherwise, um, but hopefully useful. That's, that's the whole goal. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because I know that you were, uh, you know, we, we were studying together at Royal Academy for a while and uh, I always appreciated not only your, your, your uh, great guitar playing, but also your work with transcriptions and research. And I've, I've always been sort of, I've always held you up as an example of a musician who's not just, you know, a player, a performer, but also somebody who's just really intelligent and good at, good at researching this stuff. Uh, so is it a little bit like the movie Inside Out? It's a, gosh, I haven't watched it. Um, what I should oh. say is, uh, th thank you very much like, for your comments. It's probably uh, a lot more than I deserve in there. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, tell me more about the movie, like Inside Out. What, what, what is this? So I haven't watched it either. <laughs> so we're great, great people <laughs> talking about something. <laughs> but Mircea, is, that's like one of, like, don't reference a movie you haven't watched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, am I, what am I even doing here? Um, no, the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the joking, reason, sorry. Um, no, but this is this is this is correct. The, the reason why I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, talking about this, I, I know that I know that it's about uh, different characters that represent different emotions, and they are sort of working uh -huh. inside a character. I think it's a young female character. Um, oh wait, I think control... I have seen it then. I just didn't <laughs> oh, know you're all like that. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. I guess yeah, it can it can be something like that. This idea that that yeah that we have discrete emotions like we, we have I don't know anger fear joy um, you know love or tenderness whatever and right. then you can kind of work out more complex emotions by these being I don't know a certain percentage percentage you know a, a little a lot of joy a little bit of uh, anguish you know and you get a, a complex emotion so um, I should also maybe I can I can get more into this like when we actually start with with, with the exposition but yeah um, we have I a presentation say, and everything ready this is I'm very much I even made a powerpoint yeah 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 yes. the, the most outdated thing ever <laughs> <laughs> nice well let's give it a go yeah 
Um, yeah, sounds good. So before we do that, there's one question I would like to look at in the forums. You don't have to answer it now, but I just want to uh, mm -hmm. present the fact that it exists, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have our, uh, phone, uh, our forums on ToneBeast, uh, which are you know accessible to everybody, for everybody to read, uh, even if you're mm -hmm. not a ToneBeast subscriber. And if you want to write posts in it, you do have to be a ToneBeast subscriber. But uh, this is the dedicated thread that I made just for this live stream that we have going on today. Uh, there's one dedicated thread for every live stream. Actually, let me go and uh, and click it. You see, there's all kinds of things. You can see some of the people that we've had as guests here recently: Cecilia Pereira, Jan Koch, Julia Ballade, T. Y. Zhang, Steve Goss. Um, and in each one of these, we have our uh, beloved members uh, writing questions and talking about the video and the live stream that we're about to do. Um, this one comes from David Chitsi, and he says, uh, question, how does one differentiate from the desire to play as technically accurate as possible with the human need to express emotion and intensity in a live performance? Is it even possible? It's a really hard, it's a really hard and broad question. And I don't expect to really be able to answer it until maybe at the end of the presentation. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to, first of all, say it to you um, so that you you keep it in mind and also show people what the forums, what the tone based forums are all about. So, um, yeah. Do you have a, any quick thoughts on that or should we just uh, do the presentation cool. first and then um, talk about it? Yeah, I, I, so it's something I hope to be able to answer throughout the presentation. So maybe I'll come back to it towards the end. You can remind me if I happen to, to forget at any point. But, um, but yeah, I don't want to give too much away. That's great. Um, that sounds that sound wonderful. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm just uh, chatting with some of our members from Tonebase Live, uh, just uh, doing the, you know, just making sure that everything is working well and, uh, and looking, looking good. But all right. So should we jump uh, straight into, should we jump straight into the presentation? I see there's a, there's a question from Anonymous who says, how to get rid of guitar string squeak? That's a very good question. It's a little bit off topic. <laughs> just, <laughs> we always do want to get rid of the, rid of the, of yeah. the squeaks, uh, but uh, sometimes they're part of the music. Let's, uh, I let's guess it's relevant. If it causes them distress, it might be some, somewhat relevant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. If it's, if it's something that's, that's, that's causing you a lot of pain and it's preventing you from playing. Uh, a, little, yeah. a little off topic. It's fine to generally ask questions about anything that you think, you know, Emmanuel specifically might be able to help you uh, with uh, or with something that relates to this, uh, to this uh, live stream topic uh, specifically. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll just leave it there. And we'll see if we uh, we'll see if we get uh, if we get to it um, at all. Uh, all right, cool. So uh, how about uh, we jump into the um, into the presentation? Uh, there we go. Uh, no, I made a mistake. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna fix it in a second. I'm just trying to. I don't know why this happens. You know, my computer gets a little overwhelmed uh, when I stream to a lot of different destinations at the same time. And so um, uh, sometimes I try to uh, adapt things in uh, quickly uh, while I um, while I speak, and uh, sometimes it doesn't work. So your video might be flashing a little bit right now. Uh, I do apologize if that's the case, but um, it should be uh, it should be fine. All right. So I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Let's see. Let's see if this works, if this helps at all. All right, cool. Um, so uh, do you want me to show the PowerPoint that you prepared? Yeah, uh, I mean, it doesn't have that much information, but it might be nice to have something to, to look at while I speak. Sounds good. Let's, uh, and, let's do uh, it. This is, uh, oh, this is definitely not it, uh, but it was supposed to be it. I don't understand why it's not being shown. Uh, let's uh, go and just make sure that this is working. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, we have time. There we go. There we go. I got it. I got it. It took me, took me a while, but I, I got there. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry for this, guys. If I go back and forth, this is, yeah, nice one. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll get started. And uh, just to say, if anyone has like um, a, a quick question, which is pertinent to what I'm talking, do send them through. And uh, I'll ask Mircea to just interrupt me uh, if, if he thinks any, anything might be worth discussing. Um, but yeah, I, I'd, today I'd like to talk a little bit about, as you see in the, on, the, on the screen, the application of basic emotion theory and performance. So it sounds kind of obscure, but hopefully you'll realize that it's uh, very simple ideas that might help or support our, our musical practice. That's, that's the whole goal here. So what is basic emotion theory, sometimes referred to as BET? And uh, in psychology, it was basically 
um, an area of study that emerged in the 1970s, I believe, um, where human behavior or human kind of uh, uh, affect could, could, could be described as, as a small number of basic emotions. So some people, some academics say it's nine basic emotions, some other people say it's seven basic emotions, some people say it's five, which I'm not that interested in. It's a basic concept that our human experience emotionally can be kind of described in, in a small set of you know, categories and the interaction between these. So the way this was studied was in correlation to facial expressions. So you have, uh, I don't know, photos of, of anger and people, you know, putting these really angry faces or tenderness and, and love and how that, that changed. And, and uh, it provided a kind of way to uh, analyze emotions in, in different, you know, human beings or even sometimes animals. But anyways, what we're interested in, of course, is how this carries over to music. So in musicology, roughly speaking, you know, connections between human emotion and music have been studied by, for, for a long time. Uh, however, a systematic ap application of basic emotion theory is relatively recent, something that's happened maybe in the last uh, two decades or so. And instead of relating emotions to, let's say, facial expressions, as people or um, academics did previously in psychology, they relate them to auditory cues. So, uh, what kind of emotions are associated to maybe a loud sound or a soft sound or sounds which are played with short articulation in a fast way or with uh, long legato articulations in a, in a kind of slow manner, all those sorts of things. So we're kind of making connections between auditory cues and their uh, response in, in you know, human beings. So uh, for this, I think, uh, the work of Patrick and Jocelyn, for anyone who's inclined to search a little bit more about this, uh, he's really one of the leading, if not the leading academic in, in this area. And only two years ago, he published a fantastic book, um, which is this one here. It's called, uh, you should probably overexpose, you can't see the title, but Music, Musical Emotions Explained. Um, it's published by Oxford University Press. I haven't read the, the whole thing because some of it is actually quite dense academic uh, stuff which uh, kind of goes right over my head, but there's some practical things that I've found quite useful that I'd, I'd hoped, I'll hope to uh, share with you today. So, okay, the basic idea is basic emotion theory, these discrete set of emotions that we have as human beings and in musicology, uh, the ability to kind of correlate these with specific auditory, auditory cues. We'll get more into that in, in, in a little bit. Okay, so why should this interest performers because it sounds uh, quite abstract, quite maybe um, rational, over-rationalized and maybe of little interest for someone who's perhaps just more interested in, in playing and performing. Well, uh, I'll tell you my, my opinion. For this, I just need to take one step back and it's kind of a question of musical philosophy or why do we play music? Again, musical philosophy sounds very grand, but it's, it's a very simple question, you know, why do we play music? And uh, different people will have different answers about that. Um, I certainly have my own, which I won't burden you with right now, but um, what I am interested in is the fact that emotion is a key motivation for listening to music, <coughs> apologies, um, throughout a large number of, of the population, you know? Especially, especially uh, non-classical musicians, you know? When, when they talk about music, it, it has to do a lot with uh, them feeling identified emotionally in the music or uh, them being kind of self-regulating themselves by listening to certain music, you know? If they feel stressed, they listen to relaxing music or whatever. Um, sometimes I feel as classical musicians we downplay the emotional element in music sometimes because it sounds a little bit, I don't know, cheesy or a little bit um, kind of um, unnecessary, you know, we, we, can, we can talk in more technical terms instead of talking about sadness, anger, and joy, we like to talk more about uh, you know, the sophisticated articulation section and the phrasing, whatever, uh, but at the root of it, you know, when we perform, um, listeners usually come to listen to our concerts uh, for the emotional experience. So at least emotion is, to a large extent, a great part of that. Um, so, okay. If then emotions play a central uh, part of, mu or in music, I should have written, sorry, exactly how performers can best communicate emotions 
is critical. So, okay, so if music is about emotion, then how I communicate emotions is obviously very important. So this is now, um, having established that, this is kind of my, my basic uh, structure of how I, I see the, you know, the, the, my work as a musician, you know, that the process is I have the music, which in classical music is, is usually means we have a score, you know, with the notes written down. And I can analyze it and kind of understand it, maybe from a perspective of what the composer was trying to say. Uh, but then I form my own artistic concept or interpretation of it. Uh, whether I want it or not, I may, may be um, trying to be as faithful as possible to the composer's intentions. But however hard I try, it'll always be filtered by my own subjectivity. And then some people take it further and they say, you know, I want to put my own... Uh, my own kind of signature, my own seal in it, and they really try to be distinctive and uh, have a very kind of off the, the beaten track uh, interpretation of it. Uh, but whatever, whatever that, that may be, if you're trying to be faithful to the score or not, or uh, trying to be super original, you have some kind of artistic concept. Uh, perhaps you feel a piece uh, or a passage, you know, reflects some kind of emotion, and then that begs the question uh, of the technical medium or the execution. How do I actually deliver that? So the music, like reading it, you know, understanding the symbols, what the composer is trying to communicate, then my own artistic vision, and then the execution, you know, through technique. That's kind of a very basic structure. And, uh, and this is more just personal, by the way. This isn't so much based on like academic research or anything. It's just like my own personal understanding, and uh, which has been fed by teachers or, you know, by conversations with friends, uh, rehearsals playing chamber music, whatever. So, uh, in that process, one element that I find really useful is that of, or one concept is uh, reproducibility. So the fact that I can make decisions that have a similar effect uh, again and again. So if I feel that a certain piece of music is about a certain kind of emotion, you know, I don't know, despair or something, I, I would hate for that to be kind of uh, perceived as, as joy, you know, <laughs> in, in, a, in a different concert, let's say, uh, by a lack of, um, you know, very, by lack of, of, of my preparation or my artistic process. It's like uh, a, sh a Shakespeare, you know, like, um, uh, or, or any kind of theatre work. If, if it's a comedy, you know, you don't want it to be perceived as a tragedy <laughs> and vice versa. There are certain subtleties you can work with, and so in the comedy you can make it more or less funny or with some, you know, tragic undertones or whatever, but overall it should retain the, the basic quality of what it's supposed to be, and, uh, and the opposite is, is true as well. So I want to have the knowledge or the certainty that whatever I do in one concert is hopefully going to be similar uh, in, a different, in a different concert. So for this, specific musical ideas should have specific technical consequences. So if you think something is sad, you should have a certain technical element um, to be able to hang on to, to say, if I want to make it sad, you know, I will make this sound uh, dark, you know, I, I'll make it sound lazy and legato or whatever it is. But you, you have to have some kind of connection. It can't just be in my mind, by the way. Uh, this is not, you don't have to adhere to this, but m my vision is, um, you can't just leave it up to chance, you know, if you're, especially if you're a professional musician, you know, you're trying to convey these emotional experiences to people, you uh, hopefully have to be up to scratch uh, in your profession and be able to, you know, um, convey those emo effect, emotions effectively. So, okay, how to make these decisions? That's kind of the, the big question and what basic emotion theory um, applied to music specifically hopes to answer. So this is a bit of a caricature, but let's go with it. If, if, you know, I think this music is about the bitter anguish of loss, you know, like a really like uh, complex emotion. Uh, okay, great. So does that mean I play the F sharp loudly or quietly? You know, it's like um, what I was referring to earlier. You can't just have a vague inspiration about something. So hopefully you have some kind of uh, chart, some kind of uh, roadmap. To, to guide you in making those decisions. And uh, those frameworks can be, in my experience, divided in, into two. You can uh, have your intuition, which can be, you know, very reliable for, for yourself. What, the challenge there is that um, 
it won't necessarily be shared by other people. So you may think that by playing something in a certain way, you know, it makes it sound very, uh, very sad and someone else may feel maybe it doesn't convey so much sadness as some other emotion. Um, so it's, it's a bit kind of, uh, a bit vague and it, it's subject to a lot of variability, you know. So one framework that I find particularly useful is that of cognitive science. Um, so it's the application of, you know, basic emotion theory in music, which uh, I, I put there in, in brackets, I think is, is kind of intersubjective. So yes, there is still an, a subjective element, you know, if you put a group of 20 people in a study to listen to certain sounds and you ask them what it makes them feel, of course, they will probably give you different answers. Um, but sometimes, more often than not, you can actually start seeing patterns emerge. So, okay, if out of 20 people, 15 thought it was sad, okay, that's a pretty, pretty useful uh, number for you to make decisions about. So, okay, when, when this sound or when these legato soft sounds were played with a dark tone, it made people feel this way, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the logic I want to I wanna hold on to because I think, oh, okay, if I, if I do that, maybe uh, more people will understand what I'm trying to, to convey. My performance will be more effective from, a, from an emotional standpoint. So, so finally, that all of this can be kind of synthesized in one wonderful chart, which is, uh, which is in, in this book and lots of his, his previous papers, uh, that of Patrick Jocelyn, I, I, I mean. And it's this little chart here, which I was quite fascinated with when I first came across it. So uh, I hope it's okay for me to put this here. Uh, I, I believe it's fair use as it's educational. Um, I won't encourage you to, to uh, screenshot it. Um, um, wink, I guess. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, here we go. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just read a little bit. I don't know if some people are watching their phones. This might be tiny. But... Um, but let's have a go. So you have positive valence. Um, so think emotions that are positive, uh, such as it says there tenderness and happiness. And then um, if you go down, you have negative valence. So ne uh, emotions which have negative connotations, such as sadness, anger, or fear. And then on the horizontal axis, you have low activity and high activity. So again, you can, you can read through this um, positive valence with low activity. So positive emotion, but which is kind of subdued, you know, tenderness, that, that's, that fits in quite nicely. And then positive valence, but with high activity, happiness, joy, that kind of thing. Negative valence with low activity, sadness, and then negative valence with activity, fear, and fear, those more kind of energetic um, feelings. And then what I really like is, hopefully you can read here, you have certain musical, um, musical words you know, associated with each of these emotions. So tenderness, for example, it says slow tone attacks, perhaps not as pertinent to the guitar as with uh, stringed instruments, although with the guitar you can still try to make a, a slow attack. Um, then low sound level, which just means like low volume, uh, small sound level variability, so maybe a kind of constant dynamic range or a narrow dynamic range, nothing too loud and too quiet, you know, because that would make it sound very exciting and then very subdued, not quite what we associate with tenderness. Uh, legato articulation, soft timbre, accents on stable notes, soft duration, contrast, etc. So. Uh, you kind of read through this and uh, from a subjective standpoint or my own experience you know as, as a music student many years and listening to music enjoying music i, I can kind of go yeah I, I i quite agree with that you know that those all those musical parameters kind of go along with what i might think is uh, tenderness musically you know and then happiness i won't read through the whole thing but just a few examples so happiness staccato articulation yeah that makes sense uh, large articulation vari variability. Okay, so if you have like staccatos contrasted to legatos, yeah, that makes sense. High sound level, so more dynamic, um, higher dynamic range, um, or I shouldn't say higher dynamic range, louder sounds rather. And okay, low activity, sadness, um, legato articulation with dull timbre, okay, you know, dark notes, uh, slow vibrato. So you see all of the things in these charts chart are highly actionable. You know, so I can I can go back to my idea. Let's see here. Okay, so if I'm if I have my music score, okay, I'm analyzing it, and I, I come to the determination. This passage here, I think represents uh, 
you know, uh, what is it? The, the bitter anguish of loss. Okay, bitter anguish sounds kind of obviously negative valence, kind of high activity-ish, and uh, maybe a little bit of low activity mixed in there. So I can have a look at my, my chart here, or rather uh, Patrick Jusslin's, I shouldn't steal it, uh, and, and think, okay, so if I want to like describe anguish, you know, high sound level, so loud, sharp timbres, uh, spectral noise, I think that has to do with the attack, um, staccato articulation, whatever. So if you're playing an elegy, for example, you know, suddenly our caricature of the bitter anguish of loss is, is, is not so abstract, you know, an elegy is meant to be um, composed for the passing of, 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 of someone, more often than not a, a loved one. Uh, I don't think I've ever like, seen an elegy for someone who the composer <laughs> didn't feel uh, positive emotions. Sounds like it's time for but, somebody to write that. Yeah, exactly. Like whoever that will do like a, a, a composition competition, like whoever writes the best elegy for someone they hate like, <laughs> will take the prize. Um, but, but yeah, so, so suddenly, hopefully this starts to kind of fit in and, and make sense. Um, so, okay. I, I don't, I don't know if there are any questions so far. We have a couple. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we have, yeah. uh, we have a couple on, 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 uh, tone base. And, the, the, the first one that I'm really interested in is Julia from five minutes ago who asks, will there be examples of what Emmanuel is talking about? And that is, Oh gosh. Yes. Nice. I was, that was also <laughs> going to be my question. So I'm really, I'm really happy that Julia asked that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Like it, it, I often speak too much, so um, no. So yeah, just stop me at any point. <laughs> I would like to see. I would like to see examples of these things, but I don't think that you speak too much. I think you. You know, this is a very complicated topic, and if you don't talk about it, you know, if you don't introduce it properly, it's very easy to misunderstand. So I think that this is just the right mix. I actually have my guitar here as well. If we want to uh, talk about any any guitar awesome. stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. You should. You should. You should play something. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the, the few examples that, that I have. Uh, which are really simple. Hopefully, you know, if anyone's interested in these uh, examples, they can actually try them out themselves. I didn't want to choose anything uh, kind of out of range to the vast majority of, of uh, players. So Sounds good. Here we have one that I really like. Uh, Torija, okay, by Federico Moreno Torroba, uh, which is appropriately <laughs> subtitled uh, Elegy. Nice. <laughs> so, okay, let's check if I'm in tune. So, um, so I'm just going to do an experiment and I'm going to, let's see, well, th this model, this framework is, is not meant to prescribe like what emotions should be conveyed. It's, it's not really uh, that part of the process that we're dealing with. I'm not here to say uh, this should be played like this. Like hopefully you can come up with your own ideas about what a, mu a piece of music represents. You know, is it, do you think a passage is about joy? Is it about sadness or whatever? Uh, what I'd like to offer you rather is, is kind of the tools to make that happen. So I'm just going to take this piece of music and I'm going to um, assign it to kind of arbitrary emotions. Um, and then maybe we can have a discussion later about which one seems more appropriate. So let's say I think this is about um, joy, you know, the opening bars. So if I go back to my... I might table here. Okay, happiness, staccato articulation, large articulation variability, high sound level, little s sound level variability. So kind of loud without changing the volume too much, um, you know, staccato articulations mixed with legatos, a bright timbre, fast tone attacks, sharp duration contrast. Okay, so I can kind of change the, the rubato. Okay, so if I try to inspire myself in that, then I can do something like this, maybe. No, the, it's, it's, that's one option. It kind of feels uh, merry and, and cheerful and whatever. Maybe, uh, sorry for the caricature like interpretation, but anyways, it's, it's our experiment here. Uh, one, but one, now let's go over to the yeah. Go for it. One question: uh, Did you switch over to the guitar mic? No, I did not. Oh. That's really good. That's fine. I'm I mean, it already sounds now. great. But we can make your beautiful sound come through even better by doing that. I know the voice is going to be a little Hope. boomy, but who cares? That's fine. Hopefully, this is better. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, second attempt. So this is our joyful rendition. Okay, so that's our kind of joyful version with staccatos and lar uh, large or high level of volume and whatever. Let's take the other approach. Let's go for maybe tenderness. Okay, so if we go back to our chart here, it has slow tone attacks, low sound level, so a bit quieter, uh, small sound level variability, so nice and smooth, legato articulation, soft timbre, so maybe a nice warm sound, uh, soft duration contrast, so subtle rubatos. Okay, let's, let's try that now. Let's see what, what comes out. Okay, so those are kind of two really uh, tremendous opposites. Um, and now, I mean, maybe it can have a discussion. I, um, of course, it's subtitled Elegy, and I, I kind of feel, well, this, the second rendition is much more uh, appropriate. So this, in this case, it might seem like pretty obvious, like who on earth would play this piece the, the way I did at first? Uh, I don't think I've ever heard it like that. Um, but occasionally, you know, you can hear certain performances which have certain elements of that, like maybe some notes are played staccato, uh, you know, for technical reasons, like you know, the legato isn't completely there, or sometimes, um, I don't know, the rubatos are just a little bit too, uh, too affected, too crazy, which is something more of the, the, ha you know, the happiness area. So um, this was my caricature of two comparisons. Uh, but you can actually find some performances which are in the middle, not necessarily because the performer um, wants to convey that specific emotion, but because they don't really think too much about this. And I kind of see it a lot in uh, occasionally some students that I work with. So that's why I find this framework really useful, because although it can describe what seems like certain you know, obvious things, is that it allows you to kind of rationalize it, to structure it, and to uh, reproduce it consistently. So you can kind of develop some, some principles for performance and for analysis. So next time you, you, you know, you're studying a new piece and you say, okay, this has this emotions involved, you already know which musical parameters kind of go best uh, with that. So I don't know if, 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 if that, um, if, that, if there are any questions or if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. There are some uh, questions in the chat, but before we move mm -hmm. on, uh, I want to say, uh, I want to I wanna, I wanna just bring our attention to something. On the previous uh, score, it says edited by Emmanuel. Is it a version that we can find somewhere that we can buy or that we can look at and admire? Oh, yeah, uh, that's, um, I had a look, wait, when did... Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I think yeah. I'm not like supposed to like release it because of copyright. Right. I'd love to. Man, um, you know what I hate but... about copyright law is that it makes us happy that the composers yeah. are dead for a long time. I think it's, <laughs> you know, Gosh. it's sort of functioning against its original intent. Yeah, and... like, if only this guy had died four and a half years earlier. Like, I, I know, right? <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a thing that started out to protect the creators and their rights, yeah. but it's uh, really functioning uh, in a in a yeah. very um, a very, uh, let's say, unproductive way right now, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but let me just say, this score has nothing particularly special about it, except that I think I just taken out like other people's fingerings, um, because I, I sometimes like to have like a nice clean score. Yeah. So you, you can kind of make. I mean, the the, the, the usual way is you, you take. Is it called tipix? Like this this uh, white stuff, and you kind of just take the, the fingerings off an existing score and then you photocopy it and you have like a fresh right uh, fresh sheet. So that's like just, this is just a slightly like more painstaking version of that, like just copying the notes. Um, uh, so you don't, you're not like particularly influenced by, by anyone else's fingerings. And well, now that you mentioned that, I'll, I'll tell you why I did it specifically. I mean, there, I don't remember who made the edition. It's probably best I don't remember who made it. So I don't get to name anyone, um, but the, um, there's one fingering uh, that, or that everyone plays, where is it, in bar three, four, five, six, I think it's bar, bar five. Okay, so when I go here, oh, I tuned up. That's 
my, it's my fault for making so this it is the go thing back like that. <laughs> no worries. So uh, when I go here, I'm just going to do the upbeat to, or the lead into bar five. That's how most people play it. They go from here, from, uh, what is it? The, so bar five, this is the fourth quaver. I don't know if maybe, yeah, thank you for putting the score up. So if I do this, if I play with the bar here and then jump here, there's no way I can connect that. It's not going to be legato no matter how hard I try, right? So if, you know, I've determined this piece is an elegy, it's mellow, it has to do more with tenderness than with, than with joy, for example, then I kind of think, well, gosh, that, that doesn't really align with my interpretative vision of the piece. Right. And the, the, the technique is getting in the way with my interpretation. So how do I solve it? And, well, you can actually play in such a way where you drag you drag the third finger down to the A on the first string. It's a little more uncomfortable, but it, it gives you a very different effect. So I'll try to exaggerate both versions. So. Okay, I get that horrible cut between this, and then now if I do this, suddenly my ear followed the melody down and it's consistently legato. So you see the, this system, you know, has helped me take a, a very specific technical decision, determination, to be able to keep the line legato and therefore, you know, better express my um, my interpretative vision of the of the of, of, of the piece. I'm sure I, I, I was redundant at no. one or two points. No, no, phrase, this is great. This is great. The idea. This is this is a topic that I actually talked about a lot in my own live streams on Tone Base Live before I had one that was mm -hmm. called infusing your fingerings with meaning. And it talked about how, you know, it was a little bit, little bit different because we weren't just, we weren't focused on just translating emotion uh, in such a, a concise way as you are, but it was about, you know, you don't just find fingerings for a piece and then you apply the phrasing and dynamics, but rather you make your fingering choices based on these things that you want the piece to be, right? So you, you can't just... Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, 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 yeah. They penetrate every choice, you know, your choices at every level. Yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly my point. I, I think it's like, um, you know, sometimes I, when I was at college, music college, like you, you can hear people say, oh yeah, I just... Like I'm learning a piece, I'm just, I'm just fingering it and then I'll like, you know, then I'll properly work on it. It's like the fingering is something you need to get out of the way. Yeah, exactly, kind of exactly. You know, just, a, just a chore that needs to be done, like, you know, cleaning the, the bathroom. Like doing your nails, like, you you know? Know, before you start, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and no, it's like, sorry, I, I'm going to change my microphone. because. Oh no, actually you can just keep it, since we have the, since we have the, look, yeah. we have this, uh, this example rich part of the live stream, your voice sounds more than okay. good enough. People were on Tommy's were also saying, just stick with this one. I mean, they get Guitar obviously is a awesome. lot better. Just no, no worries about it. Wonderful. I'll leave it then. Okay. Yeah. So uh, fingerings, it's not just something a, a chore that needs to be you know yeah. done you know get over with, but it's the very vehicle through which your music making uh, is expressed. Exactly. You know? Fingering is everything. Exactly. You know, it's it's just as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, and um, let's see, I, what else? I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were yeah. actually showing a different example. And by the way, uh, Peter in, in the comments on Tonebase is saying, please contrast sad and tender. I don't know if that's something that you were planning to do at all. Uh, sad and tender. Okay, let's see. All right. Um, Should I bring up that? Let's bring try. up the chart again. All right, I have it. I spent all my time like preparing the PowerPoint though, so I'm, I'm let's see, we'll, we'll need to do this. That's fine. We don't, we don't Sadness necessarily is... try, look, we can do it at the end if we have time. We don't need uh -huh. to do it right now. Let's try it right now. That's, okay. uh, that's great. Sadness. Actually, let's try it with the next one. Emmanuel that's... never backs down from a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Bring it on. Okay, let's see. So we have this one. Let's start by making like doing a bit of a meaty reading of this this example. So fairly flat and, and see what, what comes out. So So that's very metronomical, you know, the, the dotted quaver and the semi quavers one, two, three, dot 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 very precise. 
Uh, not very inspired, not very enjoyable. I don't enjoy playing it. Uh, I don't think you enjoy listening to that. But anyway, <laughs> that's our kind of very, very object. I hope you don't enjoy listening to that. Um, <laughs> I mean, your tone um, color is so of... beautiful that it, just by that, you know, by, by virtue of that, it already sounds beautiful. <laughs> Gosh, you're, you're too nice. Um, stop it. People will tell you're just being too nice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but let's see. Um, let's go with... Uh, sadness. Okay, so what do we have here? Legato articulation, small articulation variability, low sound level. So maybe piano, dull timbre, warm. Uh, legato, what else do we have? Soft duration contrast. Okay, that's an interesting one. Soft duration contrast. If I have dotted rhythms, a dotted quaver and a semi quaver, um, rarely are those performed, you know, metronomically. Usually performers uh, take the decision to play them a little bit lazy. So maybe making the, the dotted quaver a little, if I kind of graph it with my fingers, you know, this is the, the dotted, the dotted um, quaver and this is the semi quaver, you know, this is three, this is one, that's the perfect proportion. Sometimes you can make it a bit more like this, where this is a bit shorter and this is a bit longer. Uh, that's what I'll try to do here. Uh, kind of making it more like triplety, if that makes sense. Uh, slow vibrato. Okay, so let's let's try applying those things. So making a sad version. So. So that would be my kind of interpretation of a sad version. Of course, there's certain parameters we, we can't change, like the actual notes. It is in a major key, so it's like, uh, I'm not going to start changing the notes. To, if you're a jazz musician, maybe you will. But, um, I think you should change it. There, there's certain... I think it should, it should be... We it should, should change it. This. Okay, let's, let's change it. Yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we should... Okay, we need like, a, like two guitar parts. We'll like make it minor, improvise. Okay. Super primitive, oh. yeah. yeah. It kind of works. <laughs> yeah, but maybe, okay, th this is really interesting because actually Tarrega uh, wrote in the fourth line here, you still have the score on the, on the, yeah. on the screen. So on the fourth line, let's have a look. Uh, okay, I'm going to take it from line three, last bar, okay. which is like the recap of yeah. the theme. So I have this. Then watch out and so there you have your your kind of minor version. Tarrega has put that in for you. So um, so okay. But, the, 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 whoever asked for the sad ver yeah. Peter, so. this is actually a really good thing. It's it's a really good uh, realization. Like you can apply these emotions, these mm -hmm. basic emotion theory to um, to to music, but it's not going to change the music itself. Like the music might still be better suited for one or another, right? A kind of emotion uh, to be applied on top exactly. of it, right? Yeah. So it's not like you can magically yeah. turn a happy piece into a sad piece, but you can make it more coherent. You can make it sort of fit with your, your view of what the piece actually is like, and you can support that through these learnings that you derive from, you know, knowing the things that you talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I did make a caveat at some point, like saying, I, I'm not here to tell you what interpretation right. to have of a piece but mostly that's just to uh, get myself out of trouble because you know you don't want to be the the police <laughs> you know with a uh, hitting people like kind of saying no you can't play it like that you must play it like this you know that's not really very exciting for anyone right right um, of course you know and so so yeah it, the, the exercise can be only taken so far like by playing like it sounds pretty ridiculous. Like it just doesn't <laughs> really suit the music. And here, like playing it sadly doesn't quite match sure. the expression. Um, however, you can have certain subtleties. Like for example, um, it's in a major key, so probably it's going to be one of the positive valence emotions. Okay, let's 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 uh, narrow it down. So then you could have tender or happiness. Okay, so if I go with tender, it could be. low uh, low volume and then low uh, volume variability and legato and whatever then if I want it to be 
um, a bit happier, I can maybe play it louder. That's one of the, the elements. Let's go back to our table here. So high sound level, little sound level variability, bright timbre. Okay, I'll try with a brighter timbre. Fast tone attacks, sharp duration contrasts. I like this one because it means that my dotted rhythms now will be sharper. So remember my dotted quaver and my, my semi-quaver. Maybe I can make this longer and the semi-quaver even, even shorter. So instead of having one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, I can have... So, okay, those kind of could be two equally plausible possibilities. A tender rendition. Or a happy one. You know, those two kind of match. Right. I don't know if you agree. I agree. I agree. You, the, you second really one sounds, one. the second one sounds march-like, uh, you know, a little, you know, yeah. proud and dum da dum you know, it sounds sounds sort of yeah. proud and sort of full of itself a little bit, but but mm -hmm. still, you know, joyful. And the first one sounds yeah. like an, like, a, like it's too hot outside, like an, you know, like almost like a, 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 a love in the time of July in south, southern Spain, you know. <laughs> You know, my, my, sorry, I'm out of tune, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's that sort of no, but that's, lazy yeah. love for me, you know, that's, that's the sort of, that's the, that's the feeling it gives me, yeah. you know. And of course, what's really wonderful about these, we have these kind of uh, extreme cases, you know, you have you know, joy and, and, and uh, tenderness or whatever, but actually you don't have these things existing as, uh, how do you say, they're not binary, it's not one or the other, but you actually have a whole spectrum in between. So you could have a slight combination. Remember those basic emotions here. You could have, you know, a combination of emotions. Right. So you don't have to go like for one or the other, but you could say, I want it to be a little bit more um, tender or a little more, you know, joyful. And you can kind of make decisions according to that. So you can say, well, what can I do to make it more, uh, feel a bit brighter, you know, I can maybe change the, the color of the sound, but I can also change the, the durations of the notes, right. remember the, the dotted notes and whatever. So, so yeah, that, it's like little hints and little tools in a way to hold on right. to whenever you're searching for, uh, for ways to best express, you know, yeah, exactly. the feel like, the music should convey. It's not trying to standardize the way that you play at all, but uh, mm -hmm. it's just trying to create a connection between certain ways of playing and certain uh, things that those ways of playing trigger, right? So, so exactly. it's not, nobody's saying that, you know, you decide this piece is tender. And so from the beginning to the end, it will be tender, right? <laughs> Not allowed yeah. to do anything that is not tender. This is a tender piece, right? And, and, right? and in fact, what's most exciting about music usually is the, the contrast or the, the journey, yeah. you know? That you have something that starts off as something, then sometimes you oppose it with a completely different thing. And, and then that, that kind of creates a kind of conflict, uh, you know, a thesis, antithesis, and then a synthesis, a kind of uh, this little, yeah, journey, for, yeah. for lack of a better word. So, for example, here you have like the minor passage, which I really like. So. If I really want to bring out the drama, the expression, then I can do this super tender. And then I'm going to bring this one out, so a little brighter and sharper rhythm. And now super sad. And hopefully, you know, by taking those decisions, th this is like, sorry, the best part. It's super. Like it's it's so full of little contrasts and things that you can uh, you can bring out uh, with these kind of techniques and it's going to make your music making all the all the all the richer I think wonderful so, yeah this is this is so great I I I'm you know we have a bit of a we have a bit of a renaissance in music to talk about you know what does it mean uh, and it's almost you know it's beaten out mm -hmm. of us uh, initially and in, in, if we go through professional music education right. Where oh yeah. it, it kind of it can mean whatever you want it to mean right and it's it's true but it's also true that we live in a context in a world where certain things are associated with certain emotions and certain feelings and and of course these yeah. are social cues like not not all of these are necessarily related to something physical but but it is the reality of the you know the culture that we live in the time that we live in and so uh, these things have meanings that we should be aware of and treading those fine lines between those meanings is a really important part of how we, you know, how we define our voice as an artist. 
uh, I think personally. Yeah. So uh, we have. A yeah, I agree. I'm... Yeah, tell me. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, it's just uh, like it's it's a shame sometimes that the kind of postmodern discourse kind of takes over. Like uh, like there is no meaning, or meaning is whatever you want it to, to be, kind of thing. Um, so, but yeah, like uh, when you know musicians were writing these music, they they thrived on really conjuring up these different. Uh, sound roles to reflect, you know, the, the, the inner kind of battling of, of, of human beings, you know, it's like such a depth and richness of human experience embedded in music Exactly. that to just say it can be whatever you want, like, you know, it can be anything. It's like, it's, I find it a bit of a shame because yeah. there's, there's so much ri richness in there and music, and this perhaps is answering a little bit about the kind of mu musical philosophy question I, I, I presented earlier. Um, like music for me is basically an, an expression of the human sensibility. It's like a little capsule, you know, which has a, a, a small part of what it is to be human. Right. And by being exposed to this, like listening to it or sharing this with other people, basically you're kind of um, ingesting like someone else's human experiences in a way. And, and in doing so, you're uh, expanding your own knowledge of the wor world, your own understanding of the world in a way. Right. And I think that that increases, I don't know, increases empathy, you know, if you can feel more than you did by yourself, you know, you're opening yourself up to, to other people's experiences. I think that's something which, um, which is conducive to like human growth and, and hope just being a better human being overall. So that's, that's a very, very subjective, maybe opinion. Uh, it, it does happen to be my own opinion, like kind of my own musical philosophy. And it is why I feel so fortunate and lucky to be a musician, why I feel children should, you know, be exposed to music because it really helps them uh, become, I, I think, better human beings. I don't mean this in any kind of elitist way, like it just basically, you know, it's, it's, it's like watching movies, you know, like you, you, you see drama and conflict that you otherwise wouldn't experience in life, you know, uh, you, you don't. <laughs> so it's kind of a good thing, like you don't actually have to go through uh, loss or tragedy, you know, to understand the conflicts of, you know, or, or why like Nazi persecution is like evil, is bad right. for society, you know, you don't have to experience it firsthand. Like you can actually watch a movie about it and kind of feel some of that emotional impact. I think music is to a degree something like that, you know, we can experience these emotions, these things. Uh, which perhaps we wouldn't otherwise. So, so that's in a way perhaps uh, answering why I personally feel like getting emotional expression right in a way, although I shouldn't say right because it sounds very prescriptive, uh, but why like thinking about these things is valuable because it has to do with what I consider is valuable about music. You know, it's kind of at the very core, right. at the essence of it. Yeah, exactly. I, I entirely agree with you. This is probably why we're friends. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is this is exactly this is exactly the point, and and this is why I think that this is such a unique and important point of view that we are you know discussing in this live stream, um, because we we have a couple of things that we can hold on to, and and we tend to learn them you know through experience after years and years of of, of playing the guitar, mm -hmm. and and that is you know that is the the, the 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 only way to really deeply learn them. But you can you can get to the bottom of certain things by just being aware of a couple of basic factors. And that's why this is applying basic emotional theory to performance. Um, so we have a, a couple of really interesting questions and discussions going on on Tone Based Live. So for our viewers who are catching us from uh, Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, uh, remember that you can ask questions uh, by joining the free live stream. This one is free. Not all of them are free, but uh, this one is free. You can ask questions by joining the link in the description on the Facebook event. event. On YouTube, uh, the link should also be in one of the comments, but uh, if it's not, I'm just going to paste it in there in a second. Uh, but we have a lot of really interesting questions from people. Uh, one of them is from, uh, well, it's from Peter, the same person who asked us to demonstrate the uh, sad versus tender. And he says, um, how culturally specific is all of this? Do you think that South Americans make the same associations of the Spanish Balinese versus Japanese? Um, this, you might be a really good person to ask if that you are what, half Chilean, half uh, uh, Polish and living in the UK, growing up in the UK? Yeah, well, um, my grandfather on my dad's side, he was Polish. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him. So the, the kind of Polish heritage eluded me 
uh, completely, aside from my, my surname, which I, I feel proud of. But right. other than that, unfortunately, I don't um, have much Polish culture in me as a person. Um, but yes, I did live in Chile and in South America. Uh, I was basically brought up there since the age of six up until when I was, I think, 22, I came to, to London. Um, so, so yeah, that's a very, very, very good question. And it's one which, you know, uh, is the subject of many kind of fist fights figuratively between musicologists, you know, you know, there are people who want to study these things and establish kind of a, almost like the, the rule, like, like these kind of sounds, uh, have these kind of cultural connotations, oh, sorry, expressive connotations, like universally, but actually the consensus is more widely than not that it's the opposite, that it actually does vary hugely. Um, there's a fantastic musicologist called Philip Tagg, who specializes in pop music. And I remember he once gave a lecture at my university in Chile, university, yeah, when I was studying there. And he talked about this culture. I don't remember what culture it was, unfortunately, so I can't like point people to the exact video, but it was, I think, an Eastern, uh, Eastern European culture that were singing as a, a kind of a choral, uh, a choral thing, which was highly, highly dissonant. Like you'd listen to it and you'd think that is painful, you know? Uh, at least that was my, my perception. But apparently in their own, uh, their own culture, it had to do with joy, apparently, you know? Yeah. So you, you do have these, these kind of yeah. uh, things that are counterintuitive, but uh, as you say, I mean, we, we live in a certain context, you know? Um, where do I perform mostly? Well, I mostly perform yeah. uh, in, in Europe, you know, in my nearby context sure. where uh, people listen to a lot of classical music. So they, they're kind of part of that little world, as it were. Yeah. So, so yeah, I can, perhaps can't use this to justify decisions and expect, like if I go to a very, very far corner of like, Asia somewhere where they haven't been exposed to class Western classical music as much, that they'll be able to understand the same emotions as I'm trying to convey. I, I, that's not really the pretension here. Exactly. Um, and, and here's yeah. the thing. This is all applied to classical music, which classical music is Western art music, right? So even if you actually yeah. were to play uh, this piece, for example, in, let's say, in a guitar festival in India, you know, I was recently a guest of the Kolkata Guitar mm -hmm. Festival in India, right? Uh, India has an incredible musical tradition that is, you know, different from Western classical tradition. It's Indian classical. They mm -hmm. call it classical. And if you just say classical, that's what it means, right? But if you play a, a classical guitar, our concert in India, then you are still performing in a Western context, you know, because the, the bubble that you've created mm -hmm. through the music that you play, the instruments that you play, the expectation of interaction between the audience and you remains the one that we are accustomed to in our culture. So this is, I'm really happy that you said this, uh, that you said this, uh, that this way, because I actually, I don't know if you know this, but I teach ethnomusicology now. Uh, instead of guitar, so my at my university, what I teach is not classical guitar. It is ethnomusicology. I have a gigantic class of two hundred students. Uh, I am only an assistant. I'm not the professor, but um, but uh, yeah. So we we talk exactly about this kind of thing about the you know the music around the world and um, and uh, and basically everything that we say is culturally specific. So basically, if you go down to the depth of it, there are basically no universals. There are some people that disagree, but Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as a general rule, uh, almost everything that we discuss here is completely man-made and it's a thing that exists in our culture. And that's fine. You know, it, it can still have meaning because we assign meaning, meaning to it, right? Uh, this not, doesn't make it any yeah. less valuable. Uh, we, you know, one of, my, one of the papers that I wrote um, on my musicological journey was uh, uh, a paper talking about cultures that uh, do not exhibit octave primacy. So there are some, you know, we, we tend to think that the one thing that every culture has in common is that they uh, basically uh, uh, um, perceive an equivalence between notes that are an octave apart. And that's certainly true in like 99% of cultures, but it's even that is not universal. So there are some situations in which that is not, that does not occur, uh, especially in xylophone music uh, from the Central African Republic and a bunch of other places. Um, there are situations where octaves are not seen as, you know, having, as, as representing the same note uh, if, if two sounds are 
uh, an octave apart. They are not perceived as the same note. So, um, you know, we think, you know, oh, that's physics. It's twice the frequency or half the frequency. And, and that's true. But how we perceive that physics is still human, right? And so there are still, even to that, which we think is so universal, there are actually exceptions. Um, and that's and that's why that doesn't invalidate or make our our work here any less important because the emotions that we that we that we cause in people from th from this culture that we play in are still valid, right? <laughs> um, and so mm -hmm. and so this this is it's important to maintain this sort of high level perception of okay, this is just one of many systems, absolutely. Uh, but uh, that doesn't change the validity of those uh, learnings within a specific system, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the eternal question, like, is it, uh, you know, nature or is it nurture, that kind of opposition, which sometimes seems very binary, like the, the question begs you to kind of subscribe either to right. uh, it's completely cultural or it's completely uh, physical and bi biological you yeah. know, responses that you have to, to sound. But again, I, I really think that those opposite, like such a binary proposition is, is useless, like usually things exist in the kind of continuum. So. I think it can be both at the same time. Like it, it's, uh, I think it has a biological, physical kind of um, yes. source, you know, which can then be filtered through culture, which might explain why, as you said, like 99% of cultures would perceive like the octave to be equivalent because right. there's a kind of a, a physical um, basis to that. Um, but then you, you have a corner case, some exceptions and whatever, in the same way that, you know, maybe a major chord is mostly perceived to be something um, something happy because it's part of the series of harmonics right if I have an E E B E G sharp it actually that the chord the major chord is in a way uh, existing when we play a single note because of the series of harmonics so it, it sounds very relaxed the reason we perceive dissonances as such is when uh, a second note you know is is that we play above uh, a, a root is not aligned with the harmonics of, of the first note. So let's right. say, um, um, okay, E and A sharp or B flat, you know, the, the B flat is really not going to show up in the series of harmonics in the E. It, maybe it does. If it does, it comes up like one of the, the faintest sounds that you can never hear. So that's why if I play this, it doesn't sound really, really great. Yeah. But if I play a B, it sounds really, really good because the B is actually a part of the, you know, the series of overtones. So, uh, so th there's, th there, I think these physical, biological kind of uh, sources that are then filtered through, you know, uh, either the widely, widely cultural, you know, per perceptions and then more individual ones, you know, exactly. kind of, of, of creators or composers, listeners. I, I just love this because yeah. we're talking about from the most practical things of, you know, how do you play this prelude? to the most philosophical mm -hmm. discussions uh, that and people <laughs> relate to this live stream. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not forced at all. You know, it just literally fits this topic. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, by the way, we have an amazing chat going on on, the, uh, on Tone Based Live. I'm just going to read some of these questions, some of these comments, and then some of the Please questions. Uh, the, the comments that don't have questions affixed to them, I just want to read them to save them because they are really great thoughts. And as you, as you know, the, the chat will not be saved. Um, so uh, Palmer says, music is a great channel for self-expression at every level. Yeah, that's exactly true. And, uh, and David says, um, uh, Mehmet says, it could be interesting reversing this. Look at how you tend to play pieces to analyze your intrinsic personality. That's a really good thought. Like you could take a look at, let's say, an album that you recorded and then uh, realize that you play a lot of things tenderly or that you play a lot of things aggressively and then realize, oh, okay, so that's something that I go to a lot. You know, my personality is, is, is that. And it's, yeah. it's not something bad, but it is something to be aware of. And you could try to use yeah. this framework also, also the opposite way to see sort of what do I tend to, what's my natural thing to do, where, what's my go-to yeah. uh, emotion, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds pretty actionable. Like in one of two ways, like you can either then play pieces that, are, that suit your style of playing really well, that you can kind of bring your own natural um, predisposition towards that kind of music and, and, and that will shine through. Exactly. Um, or if you're, if you're a professional musician, you probably need to play a variety of repertoire for different reasons. Um, either concert promoters encourage you to, you know, program different stuff or whatever, or you just want to um, appeal to a wider audience somehow. And, and you might say, okay, if I tend to play mostly like this, what can I do to complement it? Like what key exactly. areas 
and again, in very specific terms, you know, uh, I, I usually play rhythms very lazily. Uh, okay, probably need to work on being, uh, you know, being able to play more, uh, what is it, more active kind right. of energetic rhythms, you know, be a, a little faster or whatever, to be able to contrast that. Because exactly. the beautiful thing about music is, is, you know, if you want to bring out something, uh, the quality of something, I don't know, something that's legato, the best way to put it, to do that is to put it in a context where there's something non-legato. Or if you want to bring out something that's uh, mellow, put it in a context where it's bright exactly. and vice versa. So so the more variety you have in your playing, the more uh, kind of emotional contrast you're able to bring out. And that's all about, or that's what music is all about, you know, that kind of journey uh, tensions between one thing and another, you know. You, you don't want to play flat, you don't want to be flat you know, it's it's like being a really uninteresting person. Don't you know? be flat. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Don't be, yeah. <laughs> don't be flat. flat. <laughs> you don't want. You don't want to it's be flat. It's better than mine. You don't yeah. want to be flat. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not on the guitar, which is kind of true. <laughs> <laughs> don't just don't write in B flat like, major or. Exactly. B flat minor. Holy crap! Definitely the not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the shelf life of you. <laughs> uh, and by the way, a lot of people agree. Julia Don says, Mehmet, that's a great thought. Ron also agrees. Um, and uh, yeah, Kevin West says, music ex expresses things that can only be expressed through music itself. That's a really poetic and beautiful way to say it. I think this is in, in when we were talking about how music can turn you into a, what we're saying, better person without being elitist or somebody who can experience things that otherwise would not be able to be experienced. Um, yeah, mm. so uh, there's a couple of questions and I'll ask you in a second if you wanna, if you wanna take one. Um, here's a, here's a yeah. longer comment by John, which I think is great and I agree with 100%. He says, I like how you are framing this idea as a sort of practical way of inserting musical content that enhances a musical or emotional experience. Dennis as a baggage often talks about creating an actual emotional state of mind via imagining an emotional scenario while you play a piece. And he actually talked about this on Tone Based Live because he had two live streams in December in January, uh, in which he talked, among other things, about this. Um, yeah, so uh, let's take a couple more questions. I know we've already gone, we've been doing this for a, a more than an hour uh, now. Do you want to take a couple more questions or what, what would you like to do? Yeah, I, I'm very happy. Maybe a small comment about that of inducing an emotional state to be able to, sure. you know, effectively communicate it. That's maybe, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> the thing is, it's coming from an amazing player, so I, I can't say anything. Right. That's that's like a perfect, like that's a perfect route to to take. Um, I think that what I might compliment slightly is is the fact that you know our emotions are volatile. Like it can change from one day to another. They can change from you know an hour, one hour of the day to another. So what happens if we're like having a, a an off day kind of emotionally? Um, hopefully, like being a professional musician, you should be able to achieve some level of consistency. Like you still want to deliver a good concert, even though you might not be able to put, like put yourself in the emotional frame frame that that the piece requires. So I think that's when it might be a little bit. Uh, it, it can be handy to have these slightly more. Uh, I don't want to say intellectual because it makes it sound very abstract, but slightly more um, kind of. Um, Help me, <laughs> like specific Let's, things to hold on to. Yeah, you know? yeah, like yeah, like concepts. Exactly. Yeah, I think that, that that's it. Exactly, concepts. So, the 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 that like reproducibility is something that I, I feel is uh, can be useful in in any kind of professional setting. Probably, I agree. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Igor from Spain asks, does style or epoch have any weight in this equation? It's a really good question. Yeah, uh, I think absolutely. <laughs> I mean, different uh, styles have, they kind of live in their own different sound worlds in a way which kind of follow their own, you know, tendencies of, of, of certain things. So, I don't know, some styles are very, very affected, like very emotional. Some other styles are very uh, kind of bare by contrast or austere. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, in a way it's kind of it adds another level of complexity to the yeah. discussion, which I'm kind of uh, not really prepared to like, be able to talk about competently. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, if if you think I don't know, very simplistic. I hate to be simplistic, but like classical music that is from I should say from the classical period, usually is a little kind of tidier like, rhythmically. Right. Um, 
it usually has to do a lot with um, like punctuation and things like that. So articulation happens to be really important. How you define certain ideas and you start and, and if you see how you know phrases are constructed, usually in very tidy numbers, like I don't know phrases of four bars and four bars and then eight bars kind of thing. And then if you look like at romantic music, you have like huge change, changes of texture, a very asymmetric. Um, construction of phrases, so a, a, a phrase which lasts three bars and then a phrase which lasts 11, yeah. you know, that kind of weird thing, and uh, uh, which is a lot more kind of, has a lot more variability. So, so in, in the music, like if you sample tons of music from the Romantic period and then from the Classical, you might see certain tendencies emerging in a way yeah. uh, of the kind of, you know, that, that are written into the music that we can't really change. Like the, the example we did, you know, it's like that's an E major. We can't change the fact that it's an E major, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's going to be really hard to make it sound sad. Um, so we can see some of those things emerging things in different styles and, and see that they tend to be have certain emotional qualities. But um, in style, there's so much subtlety and uh, so much detail that to just say, you know, romantic music is uh, is sad and classical music is happier. It's like uh, that would be a bit not recommendable. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So there's that. That would be a very, very crass simplification of things. But uh, we were talking <laughs> yeah. about we were talking about um, you know uh, previously about how this is you know valid within a certain cult cultural context and and that cultural context evolves over time. To the point where if you go back, you know, enough centuries ago or enough decades ago, you might be in a sort of totally different culture, even if one, you know, descended from the other. So basically, just like we were saying that this applies, you know, to 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 a certain specific frame, you know, uh, context, cultural context, um, you know, as soon as you go back in time far enough that you are in a different context, then slightly different rules will apply. And your knowledge as a musician of how these change and evolve over time is going to make you capable of, you know, doing a thing that works for that particular style um, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do if you weren't aware that the difference exists in the first place, right? So, it's, yeah. of course, it's, it, does, it does matter. The same thing, for example, this, this, kind, of, this kind of chord, you know, uh, is uh, would be ultra dissonant uh, even in the Baroque. They they did use it. You know we have it even in the in the sort of Bach prelude. You know cello prelude number one. There's a, a place where we have this chord. I don't know exactly where, but there's a place where we have this exact chord. Um, and it's seen as you know it's it's a thing that needs to be resolved. But in samba music, this is a sort of basic. You know, it's just it's just kind of home, right? So the same thing can yeah. just mean very different things in different styles, and and uh, styles are defined not only and cultures are defined not only by geography but also by time. So, right? Yeah. Now, uh, one thing I, that just came to mind while I, I was he listening to you or hearing you speak is the fact that uh, it, with style, uh, we often associate like styles with like rules sometimes, like baroque music. You know, you should perform these kind of things in a certain way, like repeated notes, like say, like you usually should play them shortly, right? And that's like, uh, if you just follow the rule like blindly, I kind of feel like, oh my God, like, why would you do that? Like, I probably feel more comfortable following the rule, but understanding the kind of emotional connotation. Yes. Like, why is that usually so? And you can say, well, if you play short notes, it has, um, so if we go back to like <laughs> our chart, it's a kind of high activity thing, you know? So uh, we see here staccato articulation, both happiness and, and uh, fear. Um, so then you can, you oh, wow. can kind of use this, um, this emotional thing in a, in a different way. Like you can actually say, okay, if repeated notes were usually played short, uh, then, oh. Man, your video, my, yeah, your video went off for, for a second. I'm pretty sure it's not, not on my side. Oh. Um, you can just try, try to think... restart it, close, okay. turn it off. And I on. think, I, I sus suspect I know what that's about. It might be my camera, which... Oh, no. Right. Oh, yeah, it does, does it turn off after a certain time? I'm so off soon. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I forgot to plug it in. Let's see if I can help this guy somehow. Okay. So that seems to be doing something. Um, but yeah, I'll just keep talking <laughs> while I while I fix this. From the void, um, talking from the from the from the empty space. From the void, yeah. Space. Nice. 
So we're just saying like you can use this in a different way where if you see okay short notes, you know that those are usually played staccato in Baroque music, then that might be associated with um, you know, with one of these emotions, with happiness, anger, fear, and you can kind of use that, hold on to that, like a Sudoku, like, right. okay, if that's that, then how do the other parameters, musical parameters, fit into uh, fit into the, the performance? So that's that's one idea, perhaps. Right, right. That comes to mind. Uh, speaking of this, by the way, we had a question from a while back uh, from, I think it was John, who said, yes, an hour ago, sorry for the long wait, would be great to have just some links to relevant reading or other lectures on the subject. Thanks. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. this is the, the link is already in in there. Uh, table reproduced from mm -hmm. Jocelyn and Timmer, 2010 exposition and uh, communication of emotion in music performance. The the reference is right there at the bottom of the image. Uh, you can see it. Uh, you can see it on mm -hmm. screen right now. So John, if you are if you are curious, I would definitely look up that publication. Um, yeah, so there was definitely some movement on your on your video feed over there. Uh, I'm just gonna yeah. I'm just gonna move to to here, which is just uh, just me now. So uh, whenever you uh, whenever you do manage to turn it back on again, we'll be able to see you. Um, but in the um, in the in the meantime, we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of other questions that I think are really cool and we should check out. Uh, Kevin Kordovitz says, uh, "Is the emotional assignment of a major happy and minor sad a Western culture thing, or is this emotional assignment also found in other music worlds?" Uh, if you want, I can take this one as the ethnomusicologist. Go for it. All right, sounds good. Uh, I can tell you, yes, it is also found in other cultures, uh, but it is uh, very prevalent in ours, and we we do have a very specific case where this is uh, this is very clearly defined in a way in which uh, it might not, you know, be be the same thing in, in other cultures. So yes, it is uh, it is not unique to Western culture, uh, but we do exhibit a very strong uh, preference towards classifying major as happy and minor as sad. Right. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope this answers. I hope this answers the um, the question. Um, all right. So uh, let's uh, let's look at a couple of other uh, of other things. Oh, here's a really interesting question. I, this is it's a little bit it's a little bit of a simplistic one. Maybe it's a maybe it's a little oversimplified. But um, Lee, 14 minutes ago, asks, "What is more important, write notes?" Or musical emotion. <laughs> I think we're going to have a hard time giving a very, uh, very concise answer to that. Um, what, what do you think, uh, Manny, uh, Manuel? Yeah, just checking. You can hear me, all right? I can hear you. Yeah. Can? Should we? Uh, should we? Should I try to okay, see if cool. I can see you too? Video should be back. Oh as yeah, well. it is. Hopefully. All right. It's so nice to see you again, Manny. Nice. I, all right. Yeah. It's, it was a rookie mistake. I, I I kind of assumed we wouldn't go over uh, like an hour and, and whatever, and fault. and the battery ran out. So apologies for that. Um, but yeah. So I think both are important, unfortunately. <laughs> like, right, right. Uh, like we, we often want an excuse like, oh, I, it doesn't matter if I make mistakes, if I'm super musical or, um, right. or vice versa, as long as I don't make many mistakes, like that's, that's all right, uh, especially if you're doing competitions or whatever. But I think both are equally, uh, are really important because like, if you make enough mistakes that someone will get distracted and stop uh, enjoying like the content of what you're doing, you know, however wonderful your musical ideas are, you're kind of, uh, in a way, yeah, you're, you're detracting from the musical experience. You know? right. uh, in the same way, uh, if you're playing flawlessly, but you have the content of what you're saying is, you know, not really inspiring, then that's equally terrible in a way. So the answer for me is you should have both. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to play 100% perfect. Like, it's, it's as if, you know, I'm speaking to you right now. If I mispronounce a word or I have to repeat myself, you know, once or twice, it's not really a big deal because you can understand me. And there goes the camera again, <laughs> so I'll keep talking. That's fine. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so because you can still uh, understand me. But if I start making mistakes or stuttering and really like just losing complete track of what, of, of what I'm saying, right. then it's going to hinder our communication. Yes. So I think that's kind of the answer, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not one or the other, but, but it's, again, it has a bit of tolerance for, um, 
for making a few mistakes. Yeah, you know, that that doesn't really. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's like you know if you if if you mess up one of them really really badly, uh, it sort of excludes you from being able to uh, play music persu persu you know persuasively. Uh, am I using mm -hmm. the word correctly? Uh, but it's not like you can yeah. really just assign, you know, weight for to one, the more weight to one than the other. It's just they're both, you know, vital aspects of music performance. Just like, you know, it's kind of a little bit like asking, you know, what's what's more important, your heart to be beating or you to be breathing? It's like, sure, you know, <laughs> you can have some, exactly. you can have some heart problems and still be alive, and you can hold your breath for a couple of minutes and still continue to live, but. Uh, you know, if if one of them is ultimately failing badly, then you you are gonna have a bad time anyway. Um, sorry, this exactly. got dark for a second. I didn't mean to. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> that's fine. So I don't want to keep you here forever. I know your camera's uh, camera's out of battery, and that's you know these live streams are really long, and I apologize for that. Uh, should we take one more question, or do you want me to just read some chat comments and call it a day, or what? Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, sounds good. I think the camera might live for another few seconds or a minute. So. We'll oh, you got it! Back. You got it back! Woo! All right, nice. Yeah. Nice. Hello. Um, I do want to appreciate how good your image looks, man. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Anyway. Um, Thanks so much. Um, appreciate it. So um, here is another question: Would you have a color correlation with keys for emotions? That some keys fit the chart you provided more easily for say happiness or tenderness or anger or sadness mm, yeah there are people i mean books have been written about that in the baroque yes. period the theory of affects and so on so certain keys were associated with certain emotions yeah. now uh some people say it's because of the actual pitch like things being higher up and lower down but actually it can be uh, associated with uh, the temperament because the way let's say a harpsichord was tuned right. meant that it wasn't equal temperament not all let's say between a C and a D it wasn't necessarily the same distance between D exactly. and an E right. or, or you know or a C sharp and a D sharp whatever so sometimes like if you had a, a harpsichord tuned in a certain way like the C major would sound really nice but like E major would sound really cringy like it, it, there was there would be some notes of the of even the tonic chord which don't sound really good so sometimes the emotional associations with of each key have to do a little bit more with that than with the actual pitch of things yeah however like nowadays I have friends who have uh, perfect pitch and, and they swear that you know, in different keys do have different emotions just by virtue of, uh, of their frequencies of how high and how low they are, even if like in an E major, the E and the F sharp is identical or if not almost identical to like a C and yeah. a D. So an E major would have a certain emotion as opposed to C. Now, the other thing, if you're playing certain instruments, uh, stringed instruments like violin or, or guitar, you know, certain keys will sound very different. So an E major will be much more resonant than our, you know, our, our, our B flat. beloved yeah. E flat major uh, or B flat minor. Yeah. Um, so E flat. Is so yeah, words. they will yeah. sound E flat on the guitar. The only e flat, way to yeah. play the, the tonic chord is here. And it's such a, you know, sweet and tender chord, but you can't make it, you know, can't make it ever sound as, as powerful as, you know, as that. Yeah. It's always just going to dominate you know, above. Yeah. yeah. I, I got to admire Soar for writing so many things in like either E flat major or C minor. It's like, goodness sake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was he thinking? Um, but yeah, so the answer is, is yes. Uh, different keys will have different emotional connotations for different reasons. So for example, in E major might actually, um, let's say, uh, might feel maybe uh, tenderer because it has more resonance so it's more conducive to legato uh, playing you know even right. if you play notes in a non-legato way you might have sympathetic resonances or harmonics which make it seem more legato than what you're actually doing yeah uh, like having a, a little bit of a pedal like a, a cheat but you could also say well the fact that so many notes in E major are open strings make them sound brighter uh, than let's say oh uh, E flat major <laughs> okay so E flat major although no not resonance not resonant yeah. will have more notes which are stopped therefore a little bit darker than most notes that you would play in an E major so you could also have use that argument exactly yeah yeah I think that's such a good point and it's it's so <laughs> that's why that's why you should ask these questions to somebody that knows as much as Emmanuel does because you 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 there's a lot of different factors that can play into them and you can be misled if you if you think of if you if you just look at things from a single singular perspective all right let's do uh, let's say one more question then i'll take i'll read out some of the most interesting chat questions uh and then we'll call it today what do you think about that 
Sounds fantastic. Wonderful. I'll just hold my, my guitar here. Yeah, per perfect. Well, actually, this okay. guy asks you to demonstrate, but uh, we, we don't have to. We don't have to. We can try. Hadi Ali asks, uh, how does the perception of rhythm affect the, the, the emotional deliverance? Can you play minor or sad chords in a happy rhythm and vice versa? In other words, does rhythm count in the context of emotion? Please illustrate with examples. Wait, I think it was on the on the chart, right? You had staccato articulation and uh, wait, were there rhythmical patterns yeah. there or, on there as well or not? Yeah, it's a, a sharp. Uh, there were sharp duration contrast or right. soft duration contrast. Right. So, for example, yeah, you could have uh, you know, like very, um, very, very short note followed by a very long note. Right. And in the same way, you could have. Uh, if it's major, well, I'm cheating because I'm, I'm changing the. Let's just do the same chord. So I can do, right. or I could do, and each of these have a slightly different quality. Or you could do, sorry. So yeah, the rhythm absolutely can just, just that single parameter can completely change the emotional connotation of something. Yeah. Uh, I think I was also playing a little louder and a little softer, but, yes. but basically I'm like trying to isolate just a few elements and use that to change uh, the, the character. Yeah. So imagine what you can do if you don't have just one or two parameters, but you're combining three, four, you know, all the musical parameters you have at your... Uh, availability, yeah. you know, your disposition. And Igor from Spain says, I think it really does, Heidi. Try playing some reggae feel with minor chords. It just won't sound sad, you know. And it's and it's true. Like if I think of <laughs> if I think of minor swing, you know, you know uh -huh. yeah, like it's minor, but it's not sad. It's like bouncy. It's you know, it's got a yeah. It's it's uh, it's it's not the same feeling at all as you know, just being. Mm -hmm. The same chords, but totally different feel because yeah. of the rhythm. Right? <laughs> if you do the same thing, but without the, the staccato, yeah. it just sounds completely different. It's, it's it, like even that single element already just changes the, uh, the character a huge deal. Exactly, so. just that little articulation. All right, let's uh, read a couple of chat uh, comments, not questions out. Um, Palmer says, funny how you can connect emotions like sadness and anger by playing in a minor key with different articulations. Exactly what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had, uh, oh, David Chidzi from a, a few, uh, about half an hour ago or 20 minutes ago. He says, as yeah. guitarists, we often focus on solo repertoire, small groups with typically other guitars, maybe flute. Yeah, exactly. Flute, singing, a couple of other instruments. I think listening to larger ensembles can uh, help us really open up the emotional experience of music. Thinking like Mahler symphony or maybe guitar for guitar involvement, concerto repertoire like Aranjuez or other concertos. Um, you know, I think he's right. You know, listening to a lot of different music will open up your ears to these things in a way that otherwise... Absolutely. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's like reading, you know, it's uh, some people, if you want to become a good writer, you know, like exactly. uh, what's the best way? Well, most people agree, like it's just reading widely because it opens your, you know, your vision in a way. Exactly. And it shows you the available worlds or, or ex worlds of expression that you can, you can get into. Exactly. Yeah, that's the same that Palmer is saying right now. Music is like emotional storytelling. Uh, I totally forgot, though, that we were Couldn't supposed to take... agree more. Exactly. We were supposed to take the question from David from the beginning, from the forums that I promised. Yeah, so... Completely yeah. forgot. So, yes. I, I was, I was going to come to that. So, it, it, how does one differentiate uh, the need to balance, you know... Uh, how, how does one balance, actually, the need to play accurately with the need to express ourselves. I think that's what I got from his question. That's exactly uh, right. Did you write it down in, or did you just remember that? Because that's amazing. I, I, I wrote, wrote, it, oh. wrote it down just so I didn't forget. Wow. And it's specifically in live performance. So uh, I think we kind of answered it, but to just kind of answer David like, directly, I'd say uh, that we, <laughs> we do need to balance uh, both in a way. Um, the one thing I, I, not that I have issue with, but I, I kind of, I don't think of this particularly like expressing myself. Um, I, I always have this feeling that no matter how much I try, it's impossible for me to be completely objective. You know, I can't, right. I cannot rid myself of my own subjective views about something. So 
to then go on and make an active effort to make my vision even more singular and you know novel just for the sake of it i find kind of unnecessary right. so I, I do like to approach pieces like uh, try to understand what the composer meant and then just form my own opinion very freely without feeling constrained by the composer or anything but i i won't feel i need to go out of my way to like add things which are not there necessarily right. Uh, just in the process of trying to figure these things out, uh, I'll add my own subjective vision, like even if I don't want to. So uh, I would kind of take out the need to express ourselves, or just the need to express, you know, something. It's, right. it's, it's going to be a bit of yours. It's going to be a bit of the composer, anyways. So I'd say you 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 need to understand. This is what we were discussing before that we kind of answered that, that both elements are important. Like like what you said. Like would you choose to just uh, you know, have food or have, have water. Well, by the end of, you know, it's three, three or four weeks, like it wouldn't really matter what choice you made. You, you need both things to live. You yeah, know? exactly. Uh, you need both things to make music. You need to uh, be fairly, you know, consistent in the delivery of the, of the notes, which are the vehicles through which we, we kind of convey emotions and things. So, um, so yeah, um, now his question might, may have been kind of slightly geared towards a more kind of, performative strategy kind of point right. of view, like our own emotions when we play, uh, which is kind of a different topic than the one we're dealing with in, in today. But in that case, uh, yeah, I'd say how to balance the need to play accurately with the need to express ourselves. Um, no, I, I might, may have been wrong on that one, actually. It's, it's, yeah, it's more about what we were talking today. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, think that's, I, think that's, I think that's what he meant, yeah. Um, so yeah. thank you, this is wonderful. I, we, we definitely did a, I mean, you definitely did a wonderful job of uh, answering that, that, that question. Um, so yeah, all right. Uh, well, Ronnie says, there's a Hebrew birthday song in a minor key and I don't think they're trying to sour the birthday child's day. <laughs> I yeah, agree. one of the many examples of kind of cultural uh, particularities, which yeah, fair enough. I, I'm not here to tell anyone like, oh, they're trying to express sadness. No, isn't, it's, it's, uh, isn't Havana Gil ours yeah. in a minor key? Mm. No. It's, it's yeah. yeah, it's minor, right? Yeah. There'll always be examples that kind of slip through, you know, and, and yeah. prove to be exceptions. So exactly. uh, I'm again I, I want to make it very clear. In fact, there were just a few more slides I didn't get through. Oh. Like this is just a tool which happens to be based on cognitive science research to seek maximum effect but it's not prescriptive like i'm not trying to tell anyone what they should consider a piece to you know want to express but for me like the main thing is that specific musical mm -hmm. ideas should have specific technical consequences however you do choose to make those those decisions so that's maybe an idea to to finish off with like this is simply a tool if it's not useful for you, like do not use it. Right. <laughs> like if it's if it's if it doesn't improve your playing or make you enjoy it more or give you something positive, like there's no need for you to use it. It's uh, simply something that I found uh, really handy to kind of have in my my shelf, as it were, to kind of pick at whenever I, I I need to like figure out how I want to play something, and it just helps me make decisions. And perhaps if if I'm lucky, it may help someone else make. Uh, similar decisions. So you're, well. you're saying you're not going to come down from the sky and tell people, you yeah, exactly. have used dotted <laughs> rhythms in a sad piece. Okay, that's not going to happen. Exactly. Good. Okay, good. I, I may gently hint at, at it or suggest it if they were to ask my opinion, but that's about as much as, as right, one can right, do. Right. So. Wonderful. Well, with that out of the way, now, now that we know that everybody is safe, um, the only thing that remains <laughs> yes. for me to do is to thank you and everybody else who joined us today on this uh, live stream. I'm really, really excited about, um, uh, you know, all the, all the exploring these topics in more details uh, in more detail. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of you on, on Tone Base Live. Some of the events that we do are, are free, like this one. Uh, a lot of them are not. Um, and we always take questions from the audience in all of our live streams. We have four or five live streams per week. Uh, currently, we have two practice challenges going on at the same time. Uh, so we actually have the SOAR practice challenge, which we are uh, doing right now. We're all going through etudes from number from opus number 35 by Fernando SOAR. And people are submitting their videos for some uh, perfect time for the camera to turn off. 
people are submitting their videos for some uh, personalized advice. You can submit your own recordings to work with me on a virtual masterclass or with one of our future, uh, with one of our other teachers. We have a wonderful virtual masterclass coming up with Rene Izquierdo on the 20th, February 20th. Uh, and for that one, we're also accepting some uh, recordings from all of you guys that have any 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 recordings you'd like to share with us. I think that uh, we can all learn from each other. We can all benefit from a little bit of advice. Uh, I am really, really happy to be part of the Tone-Based community. We have four to five live, sh live streams per week. Only a fraction of those is uh, transmitted on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram. So I do recommend that you all check the links in the description to go there and to be a part of everything. I'll see you all on the forums uh, I'm very very excited about uh, all the recordings you guys are going to sign you know send in I'm really excited about the conversations going on uh, we are in the middle of our uh, academy course for recording for guitarists which is uh, going to have its final live stream on Monday this Monday hosted by my uh, great friend wonderful co-host Martin Simni so I'm really really excited about all the stuff that we're doing uh, we have really great uh, musicians coming up very soon as guests we have Laura Snowden next week uh, and a couple of others uh, I'm, I'm uh, I, I don't even I can't even keep track of, of everybody but uh, we uh, have uh, wonderful guests coming in multiple times a week uh, they are some of the most inspiring and, and amazing musicians uh, in the world I'm, I'm really I'm really excited about them I've just received word that Maestro Pepe Romero would like to join us for a, for a live interview as well I'm looking forward to that and to all the other live streams uh, that we have planned thank you to everybody who's watched on Tone Beast Live on on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram. Really, really excited about this. Thank you to all the, oh my God, all the comments that I see here. Thank you, Valentina and Igor and Mehmet and uh, everything, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, much appreciated. Hope you have enjoyed this and this video will continue to be available on um, Facebook, YouTube, Tonebase. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there. Take care, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.